You are listening to Leaders and Legends, a podcast featuring some of Indiana's most fascinating men and women whose impact has shaped our state, our communities, and us. Join us as we discuss their imprint on our history. Leaders and Legends is brought to you by Veteran Strategies Incorporated, your local veteran business enterprise specializing in public relations, media relations, public outreach, crisis communications, and digital photography. My name is Robert Bain, Principal of Veteran Strategies, former Deputy Chief of Staff to Mayor Greg Ballard, and Communications Director for the Indiana Republican Party. I'm honored to be your host for our discussion. Thank you for joining us on the Leaders and Legends podcast. Our guests today are Professor Bill Bloomquist, and I guarantee you, you're going to be a hell of a lot smarter after listening to him for the next few minutes. The, without a doubt, the most intelligent man I ever met, by far not close. Also, Kim Hood Jacobs, the widow of Congressman Andy Jacobs, and State Senator Louis Mayhern making his third appearance on the Leaders and Legends podcast. You and Jim Scheller are neck and neck. Right. Congratulations on that. Punches your Thank you. More times Thank you. you. Is, it, is an audio only thing in appearance? It's, it's audio only thing in appearance. <laughs> we are at the McGinley's Golden Ace, the worldwide headquarters of the Leaders and Legends podcast. And we thank the family again for letting us come to hang out. Uh, the podcast today is a retrospective on the career of Congressman Andy Jacobs. Uh, we have done two other such podcasts, one on the career of Birch Bayh and one on the career of Richard Luger. And even though Andy passed a few years ago and the others were more proximate, uh, it would be remiss of us as a podcast that focuses uh, right now on Indianapolis and its growth not to talk a little bit about this incredibly engaging, wonderfully friendly, proud Marine storyteller, uh, some more earthy than others. But we loved him and we missed him, and we're very grateful to have the three of you here today. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for having us. All of you kind of entered, I would guess, uh, the congressman's life in different time periods. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so let's go uh, with the most, uh, let's say, impactful one first. Kim, that's you. I was looking at Louie. I knew you were looking at (laughs) (laughs) Louie. Kim, talk a little bit about how you met Andy and and your life. Are telling the him. real stories here? Are we? <laughs> Somebody said, you need someone who's smart and funny and doesn't want to get married. <laughs> and so he comes and shows up at my door, and he looks at me. He goes, well, you're a little young for me. And I said, you're a little old for me, but let's go have dinner anyway. Can I tell this? Are we going to be telling this? So, yeah. So, okay, we're, I'm looking at this guy over dinner. He is completely engaging. He looked like he'd been sleeping with the dogs. You know, I had my best pink dress on, and uh, and he does Lenny Bruce at dinner the whole time. I heard like four or five Lenny Bruce bits, including Religions Incorporated. I thought, oh wow, this has got to be the weirdest first date I've ever had. And he says, "You want to go meet my dog?" I thought, okay, all right. So we go to the Fun Farm, which is where we live now, six acres, and he's real proud of it, and he has these Great Danes. And so the Dane's running around the backyard, and and uh, and he jumps up on my perfect pink dress and leaves this perfect Great Dane paw. And I hear the cultured words from this wonderful, brilliant man, friendly, get the mm down. <laughs> and I thought, okay, we'll do this again. <laughs> no, Were you on wonderful. TV at the time? Were you yeah, yeah. local TV? local tv and so were you set up by just mutual friends a friend I, I i was going through a divorce and a friend said you need someone smart and funny doesn't want to get married but you got married we did we did in fact at the end of the date he goes well i'm busy next friday and then saturday i have something at, at early but but then after that i'm free and i just kind of looked at him and went really <laughs> i didn't think that <laughs> he 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 was in love with love. He was a very romantic person. He about once got year, me a card. Be, about what year this would be? Maybe 87. Mm-hmm. He once got this card, and it had a tablecloth, a checkered tablecloth, and these two little bears sitting there, and there were these funny little things on the table. And I he gave me the card, and I came in, and he had recreated the scene in the kitchen. Oh. And uh, best... Uh, uh, you know, when you first start dating somebody, you go, oh, I don't know them very well, and I don't know what they're doing. And he, it was my birthday, and he, it was Sunday night, and he said, 
I need you to go to the corner and mail something. We'd had a big 4th of July party. I'm a, I was born on the 5th of July. So we had a big house full of people. And he said, uh, I need someone just to go mail this. And I'm like, it's Sunday. <laughs> uh and I thought, oh, this is it. You're a jerk. You you are a jerk. I just know it. And I don't even know if I'm going to come back. And so he sent me out, and I drove around the block. It's Sunday, and how do you get something postmarked on Sunday? And I was just mad and mad and mad. You know how you, when you don't know someone. And so I said, well, I'll come back. And I came in the back door, and it smelled in the middle of July like something was burning, like he was burning the house down. And I was so wrong. Uh, he had, I love Christmas, don't like my birthday. And he had set up a Christmas tree. He had lit a fire in the fireplace, and what he was doing, in reality, was recreating Christmas for my birthday. Very sweet. He gave me a cordless phone. (laughs) (laughs) Back when they were the size of watermelons. (laughs) And I thought, you know what, this is the nicest guy I've ever been out with. Nicest guy. So did you, so when you get to the point, before we talk to Louie and, and oh, you got to talk. Professor Bloomquist, is, what point did you get to, oh, my God, we're going to get married? Oh. Like, this is this is going to be different than he, I thought it was. He, well, the, I think Surely there was a lot. To, there's a lot. The mailbox. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> well, there was a time when I thought, well, do I want to drive by this house in 20 years and wonder how he's doing? Or do I want to be a part of his life? And um, he clearly is... I, I I would imagine I, I can't imagine that both of you wouldn't agree. He's clearly the best person, one of the best people you've probably each known in your life. He he's the best person I've ever known. He, if he said he was going to do something, he did it, and he was so he was such a great husband. He was a great dad, even better after he retired. You know, in terms of being attentive. Right. He was so funny because the the kids were coming up of school age, and we had them in a private preschool because there is no you know you know how preschool is you got to pay for it. And uh, he's he says oh, he called me Burley. My name's Kimberly. He called Burley. He slam his hand on the. <laughs> he goes They're pulling the kids out and putting them in public schools. I don't want no little Lord Fauntleroy. <laughs> so, so our kids went to public school. And he's a Shortridge grad. Is that correct? He's IPS kid. Yeah. We love IPS kids here on the Leaders and Legends podcast. Mm -hmm. Louie, you met him way before any of us did, I would assume. When was your first encounter with him? We've talked about this a little bit on our Birch Bay podcast, but what's your first kind of encounter and getting in Congressman Jacob's orbit? Um, I think I, I met Andy one time when I was home on leave, I think, from the Marines. Um, but, uh, I got to know him a little better, you know, after I got out of the Marines and, uh, I got out in, in, um, end of February, 1965, he was already in Congress at the time, but I, I had met him, maybe it was even before I went into Marines. Um, were you involved in politics like in high school? Well, my family, my family was, uh, very much involved in politics and, uh, my uncle, Paul Cantwell, was Andy's first administrative assistant. Uh, but uh, um, I'm pretty sure that I met him before before I went into Marines, or maybe one time when I was home on leave. Uh, but getting getting to uh, Kim's assertion about being in love with love, I you know. Uh, <clears throat> I went in the office one time. This I was in D.C. and I went in the office one time, and he says, "Lou," he said, uh, "I saw the best movie, the best movie I've ever seen." And you know, I was tempted to say, "Better than a thousand and one Dalmatians," <laughs> because he loved that movie. <laughs> and uh, he 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 said, "Oh, he says this movie is just fantastic, the love story." Oh. Oh, Ryan yeah. O'Neill and Allie oh, McGraw. Yeah. Or? Allie McGraw and and uh, Ryan O'Neill. O'Neill right. yeah. Melvin Douglas. Oh, oh, yeah. And uh, but he told me, oh man, this I mean this is probably, you know. And then when I saw it, I told him, I thought it's a little schmaltzy for my taste, but, <laughs> <laughs> but he was he was in love with the whole the previous, notion of previous being, generations being in nope. love. Yeah. <laughs> How did you get to work for him? Um, 
what strengthened the bonds besides, you know, political involvement and that sort of thing? When I when I got out of the Marines in, in 1965, you know, I mean, I told my mother when I was 11 that I wanted to be in, a politician. So so I, I run for precinct committeeman out on the, the west side um, and uh, I get elected and um, I become I, I start showing up and volunteering at Democratic headquarters. A guy named Jim Beatty was the was the chairman. And uh, and I, I would show up there, you know, every day after work. You know, you need anything, anything I can do, blah blah blah, and all that sort of thing. And uh, so uh, at some point, um, you know, uh, Beatty says to Andy, "This is like a few years later. This is in in uh, 1968. I think Jim Beatty." prevailed upon Andy, you know, why don't you hire this guy, you know, blah, 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 and, and all that, um, which Andy did. I think he, I think Andy hired me originally at the urgings of uh, Jim Beatty. Was the Marine Corps connection? Because Andy Jacobs is yeah. probably the most famous Marine in modern Indianapolis history, I would guess. Till Ballard came along, mm. and they connected on that. And yeah. Mayor Ballard was a huge fan, huge fan of Once Andy a Marine, Jacobs. always a Marine. Yep. Well, as I've said on this podcast before, both my parents were in the Marine Corps, and my mother thought Andy Jacobs could heal with his touch, <laughs> change the weather, throw thunderbolts, lightning bolts. Well, Andy, Andy turned out only two of those three. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, Andy could well be the most famous Marine from Indianapolis. He is not, however, the most famous Marine from Indiana. David M. Shoup, mm-hmm. oh, who was the commandant, commandant Shoup, when, yeah. I, when I was in the Marines. Mm-hmm. That's a famous uh, quote. You know, we're here to help each other and have a little fun before they put us six feet down. Oh, I don't know. Yeah, that's a David Shoup. I'm not. Yeah. All I, I know is Greg Ballard said the Army stood for ain't ready for Marines yet, <laughs> which he would say to me often as a proud Army kid. But does that, did that make a difference? You'd been through that fire and Congressman Jacobs famously well, I mean, we, was in the Korean you know, War. we would talk about it every once in a while. And when uh, <laughs> when he wanted me to do something, you know, he would call me. I, I, my office was in the annex, which was like down the hall and around the corner. When we were in D, when I was in D.C., and uh, uh, so he would call me. Up, Luke, can you come over here? And so I would go down to the office and everything, and he would he would tell me, you know, <clears throat> I want you to do blah blah and blah. And then every once in a while, he would say, and that's an order. <laughs> you know? <laughs> you know? Before we get uh, to Bill Blomquist, what was he like to work for? You you worked for uh, Birch Bay. You worked for Andy Jacobs. Right. Maybe compare the two a little bit. Well, the uh, uh, you have if you're on a uh, uh, House of Representatives, you're on a representative staff, you're going to have a lot more face time. You're going to spend a lot more time with them. Your staff is not nearly as big. Uh, the district is not nearly as big. Um, I think in the D.C. office, you know, we may have had four people, five people at the most on the staff in, in D.C. Uh, and on on uh, Senator Bayh's staff, there were probably 25 or 30 people. There were, there were enough people on a U.S. Senate staff to actually form factions. Uh, <laughs> that, the that balkanization. Was, yeah, that was the that was not the, that was not the case on a, a representative staff. Last question: Did did, and I may have asked him this at lunch one time, but did Congressman Jacobs ever consider running for the Senate? No, I know he never would have run against. I'm going to guess he never would have run against no. Richard Luger because of their friendship and and mutual admiration. But he never thought, let me try to be. No. Especially after they put him on the Ways and Means Committee, yeah. because he had the, the only Indiana person last century to be on Ways and Means, and he felt that it was it was oh, yeah. uh, too important to the city. I and mean, he was they were building a city here, and they needed someone there. Mm-hmm. That makes sense. Yeah. And he didn't want to drive around the state. He didn't like yeah, that, that at all. Make, no, that does make <laughs> sense. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's Indiana's not very experience. big until you drive it. Yeah. <laughs> Bill. Yes. You met him a little later in life. I, I know he yeah. taught at IUPUI. Yeah, that was such a, a... It's through your friendship that I got to meet him. 
uh, yeah, I got to meet Andy just in time for him to uh, stop being famous. Uh, or that's not true. To stop <laughs> being in the news on a regular basis is a better way of putting it. When he announced that he was retiring, that he was not going to run uh, again in 96, that was uh, that was when we met. So I got to uh, know the former congressman and uh, my friend Andy was uh, – uh, a dad and a husband and a dog lover and a movie buff and a uh, history you know, nut and a history nut and all of those good things and you know the fact that he had also served uh, 30 years in the US House of Representatives was kind of a bonus cuz it made for a lot of great stories but uh, but we I approached him through a colleague and friend, Pat McGeever, who was in the Department of Political Science at IUPUI, and knew Andy. I didn't. And when uh, when Andy announced he wasn't going to run again, and, and uh, Pat uh, and I talked, I was the department chair, but pretty new at it. And um, Pat arranged uh, for Andy and Pat and me to meet uh, over lunch or a cup of coffee or something. I don't even remember the, the particulars of that. Just so we could get introduced and we could could have a conversation and sort of sound out the possibility. You know, my desire was to have him come and teach for us. He's a wealth of uh, great experience and, and huge benefit to our students. I didn't know him yet, but I, you know, it was easy to see why this would be, you know, a really beneficial thing to have. And um, so we had a conversation about that and uh, what his plans were post-Congress and what he would like to do and whether he would be interested in teaching. Um, and uh, just in the course of that conversation, we all just also just had a nice, nice time talking to each other and just kind of took a liking to each other and – you know, went out to lunch uh, for the first of probably a, a hundred times uh, over the next uh, many years. So, yeah, we met in 96. Did he enjoy? He eventually taught. He did. I had left the department. I mean, I had left. I had right. graduated. Right. We were done then. with you by then. We yes. were done with you. And I was not yet famous. <laughs> Give this man a degree. <laughs> Give this man a degree. And then all a... you did was go across the hall and go get a degree from the history department after that. So. <laughs> I was in the medieval time period with Ken Cutler. That's right. Uh, did he enjoy teaching? Because it, it, based on one of the things that was very interesting when when you had lunch with Andy Jacobs – don't budget an hour. That's a joke. <laughs> because even if you budgeted 90 minutes, mm -hmm. 45 minutes of that was spent with Andy talking to the people who came up to him at lunch and wanted <laughs> to have a conversation. And I always used to say, you know, Andy, we could go someplace that serves cold food. That way it's already cold. <laughs> Did he? Did he? He enjoyed interacting with people. He liked the quick. It, this is my observation after yeah. sitting with him. What did he? What did he enjoy? Or do you think he enjoyed being with young people, students who were interested in the process and the system and oh, I, all I, the above? I, you know, Louis and Kim would would know better, but I didn't ever meet anybody that who Mandy didn't enjoy uh, being around. I mean, if if you were. Um, you know, uh, the, the, my expression, not his, if you could fog a mirror and, uh, you know, had a, a half a wit about you, uh, he, he could find something engaging about you and, and something fun to converse about. And uh, we all know he was, uh, he was a fount of uh, stories and jokes. Uh, so uh, he seemed to take a shine to just about everybody. But he did like uh, students in particular. And the, and the thing... That I want to um, share, if, if you don't mind my taking a couple of minutes, is, is the way he wanted to teach. Um, we had a, a, an upper-level undergraduate course on Congress. Mm. All right. So, you know, being the not very inventive, not very creative person, I thought, well, let's have Andy Jacobs teach our Congress course, which he did. God bless him because he was nice. Um, but he didn't particularly enjoy spending 15 weeks talking to undergraduate students about Congress. The thing that he liked teaching was the Intro to American Politics class, where it wasn't just about Congress. And more specifically, he had his own way of doing it. And I don't just mean he had his own way in that he was Andy and he had all this experience and, and, and great stories. He had his own idea of how to teach the class. 
And I'm going to bore your listeners for just a second to say that, you know, the standard American politics course that's taught in college as an intro course is only and all about the national government. Here's the president. Here's the Congress. Here's the Supreme Court. Here are political parties. Here are interest groups. Here are elections and campaigns. <laughs> Done. And, um, and, and Andy just wanted to do it the other way around. And so the way we started this semester when Andy taught it was with precinct committee person, right? Because Andy had this theory, and you, you both will understand this, that if in a, in a democracy where the citizen is sovereign and the sovereign is therefore the highest authority, that the office closest to the sovereign would be the most important office. The office closest to the so- citizen is precinct committee person. So based on this sort of philosophy, our students would get intro to American politics from Andy Jacobs, week one, precinct committee person and vice committee person, and on up through the county chair and the entire, you know, party organization built from the grassroots up, and then – you know your township, and then cities and towns, and well, then he was counties in the and state so forth. House, right? He, well, and this he was, was this was the state be- house of representatives. This was the beauty of it, because I mean, Louis would have these stories. Kim would had the, had these stories. The you know he he had been a, a Marion County Sheriff's deputy. He had county store county government stories. He'd been involved in party politics. He had party politics stories. He had been in the state legislature. He had state legislature stories. I mean, but the but the whole course was like no intro to American politics course any undergraduate student at IUPUI ever had before or since. Uh, not only because Andy was teaching it, but because they started with the precinct committee person, and we ended up with Congress. We ended up with the president you know, by by week. 13, 14, 15 of the semester, we're finally getting around to the, the president, week. Congress, and the Supreme Court. And the most important week. The most important week. I knew was, it was that day because I would get up at eight in the morning and I could smell popcorn. <laughs> exactly right. <laughs> right. Kim, He's in there popping what, what, popcorn. What Kim, is, what Kim is remembering is that when we would get to Congress, it was movie week. Mm-hmm. And movie week specifically during those years was uh, Eddie Murphy's movie, The Distinguished Gentleman. Uh, which uh, which and holds, holds w- w- up which today. holds wow. up pretty darn well, and which Andy just thought was hilarious, but also educational. Uh, and so we would have movie week, uh, and we and he would bring in bags of of popcorn and like you know paper bowls and stuff like that. And the students would get popcorn, and we would show a movie. And it was like the highlight of the semester for, for him especially, for the students for sure, for me too. And uh, 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 that, was, that was just a blast. He uh, loved that movie. He I mean, did. I mean, he had the kids trained. He taught them all the lines. He right. memorized the lines. And, That's right. You know, he'd That's take right. them out and go, say that one line, Bronco. I, <laughs> That's right. Your kids. Oh, Your yeah. Kids. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Kim and Andy's They were very his, unconventional father. Right. They would have seen that movie Oh, a hundred times. That yeah. and Around the World in 80 Days. There you go. Uh, forget Love Story, man. <laughs> <laughs> love glad. Story was great, but the distinguished gentleman was education. <laughs> Did he make you sit through? What was the one? The, the uh, what was so the, many favorites, the Quaker but, movie? Oh, yeah, of course. Oh, oh yeah, uh, Friendly Persuasion. Friendly you persuasion. saw that too? Oh, oh my he, God. He, he, he was big yeah. into yeah. Hmm. There was yeah. one quote in there, but when you – and I can't remember, but the gist of it was when you argue with me or you're mean or nasty, you know, you're not getting anywhere. But, right. but oh, I, I, when, I like, the, when, I, the, when the orders me – Liza, when the orders me about, I am like putty in your hands. But when you yell and something like, something yeah, like that, yeah. 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 Well, my kid's favorite movie is Caddyshack, which is why my Wi-Fi name is Hey Wang. Uh, <laughs> I will say, distinguished gentleman, and uh, and probably love story uh, and fairly persuasion. Uh, uh, three movies that were in color, and that was not necessarily his favorite genre. No. But go can ahead. I, can I tell that one story about that? But I, it's I'll try to make it short. But so he had been invited to teach at the Harvard Kennedy Center after he retired. And uh, I was telling yeah, Bill and Liza yeah, this yeah. the other day. And, <laughs> yeah, and yeah, so yeah. we trod uh, over there and our kids were first grade. So I got a list of schools and they separate us. So I don't see them all day. And uh, my vote really doesn't count. It's he's he, he's he's 
Anyway, we got back on the plane to come home, and he said, uh, how was your day? And I wasn't really particularly happy about where the kids would have to go to school, but that was okay, you know. And he said, well, would you mind too much if we didn't do this? And I said, that'd be fine. He said, I just think that these kids over here, you know, they're straight A's, that's great, but they're lucky. They're lucky that they landed in this university. I want to go home and teach because our kids at home at IUPUI are just as lucky. They're just as hardworking, and I want to be there. And that's why mm-hmm. we did not go there. Sounds like the Andy Jacobs I got to hang out that's with. That's right. Yeah. You are listening to Leaders and Legends, a podcast presented by Veteran Strategies, a local veteran public relations enterprise, and sponsored by Girl Scouts of Central Indiana the Crown Plaza Union Station in Grain Hall and Conference Center, and McAllister Machinery, your friendly neighborhood Caterpillar dealer. Mm. We are here with former State Senator Louis Mayhern, with IUPUI Professor Bill Bloomquist, and Kim Hood Jacobs, and we are chatting about the career and charming personality mm. of Andy Jacobs Jr. One of the most interesting things that I learned in my lunches with him, which Professor Bloomquist was there for almost all of them. I think I had one or two uh, alone, which were mostly history lunches where we would fight and fuss (laughs) in a good way, is his relationship, and I think there was a real mutual admiration, and correct me if I'm wrong, with Bill Hudnut. They ran against each other in 72. Bill Hudnut won. They ran against each other in 74. And then Andy Jacobs won. And One of the most interesting things about the congressman's career is how he prospered and thrived in Indianapolis in the era of UNIGOV, Hmm. when the Republicans were winning eight consecutive mayoral elections, controlled the city county council, all the countywide officials. Yet Andy not only survived, but thrived. Louis, how do you, how would you correct? characterize that friendship and and how did how did Andy endure in that time period the uh well first of all you know he when he was elected the first time in 1964 the uh, legislature had not redistricted the congressional seats since the mid-1920s I believe it was and so Marion County so the 11th district was all of Marion County it was like the second, first or second largest congressional district in the country. They didn't redistrict after the census, all those? No, after all those years, yeah. Because yeah. they didn't have to? Well, not, they just were not, like, eh. not until the Supreme Court right. ruled that uh, you have to redistrict, you know, after, uh, after the census. And uh, so they redistricted. You know, the Democrats got control of the, of the legislature, uh, both houses of the legislature for the first time since the 1930s. In 64. Yes, that's big, right. Big, big Democrat year. Yeah, yeah, huge, huge Democratic year. And so Andy's Jake, Andy's district was Center Township and Wayne Township, and uh, which was, you know, fairly Democratic. And uh, so we went along, and then until the 1970 census, and in the 70 census, the district became most of Center Township, and then... Warren Township and parts of Lawrence Township, um, which made it a little harder, but um, it would it would be pretty hard to to uh, shape a congressional district within Marion County that was n- not at least a little more Democratic than all of Marion County. Right. All of Marion County was very Republican, um, but but then finally, when seventy four happened, um, you know, or seventy two happened. It was the big, big wipeout, and um, and then Andy lost, and then came back in in seventy four. Um, Were you working for the congressman in seventy two? Yeah, yeah. How did, I, he, how did he take that law? I mean, uh, the Republicans did okay on the congressional level. Nixon got five hundred and twenty one electoral votes, so that was a huge presidential wipeout. But how did he take that? Loss? Did he see it coming, or and then was he automatically determined? Like in two years, I'm coming back. Well, yeah, I mean, yes, I think he saw it coming. We all saw it coming. I mean, we don't refer to it as we Democrats, or at least I don't re- <laughs> think of it as the the Nixon reelection. I think of it as the McGovern wipeout. Right. Um, and and it was just it was uh, carnage. 
And, and, and we pretty much saw it coming. Uh, and That's when he encouraged Julia Carson to run. No, I'm, I'm well, talking then, about when he lost. When yes. Andy, when Andy seven, lost. Well, no, so, oh, you're right. You're right. When Andy lost in 72. So then concomitantly, did you see it but coming he, again in 74 during the <laughs> Watergate summer? And oh, all yeah. That? Like, oh. Yeah. yeah. But but that time, you know, so Andy lost. And uh, so, you know, he loses the election in the first week or six or seven days of November. And so we got until January the 3rd or something like that. So he gets on the phone and uh, calls Birch by and says, you got to hire Louie. And so that's how I ended up on Birch by staff is because Andy calls up and uh, to take care of me and uh, and gets Birch by to, to hire me. Uh, in, uh, and then I went over I went over to the Senate side. It was, started in 73. It was when he lost that he got Julia to run because he said, we're going to lose. You're not going to have a job and you have to do this. And he Come bolstered up her Township up. Township trustee or? No, no. She, the, no she ran for the she, legislature. She ran she for the state. Well, yeah, she, yeah. she was, she was uh, in, she, yeah, she was elected to the yeah. legislature. Because he said, we're going to lose. You need a job. In uh, 72, she was elected. Uh, it was the first time we had uh, three member seats, I think. Mm-hmm. And uh, and so she she was uh, elected in that center city three three member seat in uh, seventy two. You know the other thing is, and you'll remember this that 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 we leave out about. We don't want to leave this out. We need to know this, and we need to talk about this now because I don't know who started it, whether it was Bill Hudnut or whether it was Andy. But they saw each other at these events, these debates. They became friends, and they started writing together. I was going to ask debates. you about that specifically. Was that 72 yeah. or 74? 72. 72. They did it both in 72 and 74. They started writing together, and they became friends. And this is what I think we're missing so much today. We, For some reason, we've lost that ability to talk to each other. Well, and one and, of the and, points and, of the podcast is to bring people on together and Louie did it with John Mutz, and Ed Tracy did it with Jim Kittle. I recorded one that hasn't been, uh, maybe by this time will it be out, with Mike McDaniel and Robin Winston, who were chairman of their respective parties at the same time. And then I also recorded one with Mike O'Connor and Paul Okeson from different parties, mm-hmm. but both served as chief of staff. That's a big part of it. And you know what? And I want to ask specifically about Hudnut, because we're getting ready to do a podcast about him. Uh, what did... What did Andy think of his time as mayor? I mean, 16 years, transformative, all the things that happened. I mean, you know, there's got to be some friction there every once in a while, right? That's just part of human nature. I just want to say I went to Bill's funeral, and one after the other, community leaders got up there and said if it weren't for their friendship, we wouldn't have the city we have today. And I can see that because Bill was mayor, and he was on the Ways and Means Committee. And look what Bill did, and, and they needed each other. Yeah. I'm going to let you guys talk because you know more. Uh, you know, I, I think Andy Jacobs um, th- thought Bill Hednett was a pretty good mayor. Uh, personally, I believe Bill Hednett was probably the best mayor this city has had in my lifetime. Um, and and I think it, it made it a little easier that Bill Hednett was not some raving right-wing goof. Uh, you know, Bill Hednett, this was back when there were moderate, dare I say, liberal, Republicans. Mm-hmm. There were at the same time moderate and pretty conservative Southern Democrats. Oh, yeah. um, you know, they, there were there were um, U.S. representatives from the Northeast, Republicans from the Northeast that were pretty liberal. Mm-hmm. You had this. You had uh, Brooke, the the black senator yeah, Republican Ed, Ed, from, Ed Massachusetts. from Massachusetts. Yeah, Brooke, and, and yeah. Uh, we've got Owen from Maine. Yeah, mm-hmm. a guy named Silvio Conti uh, from Massachusetts in in the House. Um, so it it certainly uh, lubricated the friendship. The fact that that uh, Hadnut was not uh, a, a reigning, uh, a, they, a raving conservative, we, uh, supportive for affirmative action. They, they wanted to build a good community. Mm-hmm. I think that's the thing. They they had this common goal: let's build a great community. And they, you know, as we mentioned before, Andy was IPS kid, went to Short Ridge. Mm-hmm. He could see the transformation that was happening in his hometown, mm-hmm. and. Your point about Ways and Means Committee is certainly very well taken. 
But before there was Bill Hudnut, there was Richard Luger. Mm-hmm. What kind of relationship and friendship did they have? Because there are very few people. <laughs> can we tell that story? You, we can tell all stories. Okay. Okay. So. Very few people who made Andy Jacobs <laughs> smile unprompted like Senator Richard Luger did. So D- Dick's running in the last election against he who shall not be named. <laughs> but So Andy calls him up. And at that time, Andy, Andy spent the last six years of his life in bed. You all know this. He calls Dick up on the phone and goes, Dick. I need a yard sign because <laughs> we're all worried. <laughs> so, like, within two days, we have a yard sign in our front yard. We have a house that's in a pretty prominent place that gets a lot of traffic. Right. Dick calls him a week later. He goes, Andy, would you take the yard sign out of your yard? I don't think it's helping. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because it was Republican primary. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> no, they had it. Well, and it was great. Our first baby was 11'5", <coughs> and so the first time afterward he was born, he's all grown up now. He's, you know, he's a prosecutor, and he's and he's running to the fifth. So, uh, but he's, I, I see Char Luger, and yeah, he was eleven five, and she goes, "Oh well, that's nothing. I had one thirteen five. No, <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> so no, they had a great relationship. Yeah, well, when we had lunch, when we'd have lunch with him. He would, he would. Of course, I'm like a little kid, right? So I'm pinging. I want to know all these stories about mm-hmm. all these people he right. talked to. Right. Uh, you were around him a lot more than I did. What were some of the other people, Republican and Democrat, who he admired and liked? I, I I'm going to prompt you with one to get the ball rolling. Sure. George H. W. Bush. Oh yeah, no, he was very fond of of, uh, of Poppy Bush. Um, Bush you can 49. tell the locker room n- nudity story if you like. I will. I, I will let you tell that story. I'm not sure I remember <laughs> it. Do well you remember enough. what that was about, right? Uh, yes, uh, someone okay. could tell it. I'm, 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 I'm not telling it. I'm not, I'm not sure I remember it well enough to tell it. Maybe Louis knows. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, no, I, it, he had very close friendships in the House, and some of them were Democrats and some of them were Republicans. And when you listened to Andy talk about his friends in the House, I would easily lose track of who had a D next to his name and who had an R next to his name. I can't remember right now, Kim. I, I'm sure you can, but Jim Corman, uh, his, oh, he his was little, a prince. Yeah, I mean, he was. He, he Jim was one Jim of those from guys the, from California. Yeah, 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 yeah. Represented Hollywood, and uh, he he was he was a kind of guy. He just he, he should be should have spent his whole life in Congress, but he went out of Congress that year that Jimmy Carter decided that. Uh, well, you know, yeah. I quit. He the did, and it closed. Right. What, a, what oh, an injustice! Right. Because people like Jim Corman lost, and. He was yeah, a 1980, prince. that's sure. right. Oh he God, conceded he before prince. the polls right. closed on the West Coast. And speaking right. of Californians, Pete McCloskey, I think he was. Oh, that is a close. great story. Close. Speaking of the Marines, Go because uh, Pete McCloskey beat Shirley Temple, Shirley Temple Black, in the primary. Yeah. And uh, so Andy sidles up to him on the floor. Of the con- uh, they sit down, and he said, "Well, I just want you to know, I'm Andy Jacobs from Indiana, and you're not the only Marine who did it to Shirley Temple Black." <laughs> 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 and she was married to a Marine at the time. And Pete, Pete, you know, Pete's a Republican. And he's bristling, and and uh, he, I think it's survi- uh, he's led. He he holds the Marine Corps record for the most bayonet charges. You know, so he's that, so, and he's still living. Oh God! And after Andy died, that was the first trip we did as as a family. I took the boys to uh, see Pete and Helen. Right. And they own this. So Pete recovered from the. Uh, oh yeah, they line. became friends. Well, they found out that when the Chinese overran Andy in Korea, Pete was like sixty yards above, mm-hmm. and it was just by the grace of God he was ready to call. You know, to order in the the. Right. It, it was it was a disaster, but they were sixty yards apart in the battle, in the worst battle Andy saw. I, I'll tell you one more thing, and I'll shut up. But he, no, you're here for so a reason. We're out there, <laughs> so we're out there, and I've got these grown men now, and and my husband has put all this speaking you of know, fertilizer, fertilizer in these boys, and they are great young men. But I can't find them. We're supposed to leave Pete and Helen's that morning. They own an olive grove or whatever you want to call it, and couldn't find them. I said, I said, Helen, where are the boys? We got to go. And, uh, oh, she's, Pete's got him out there. So I go out there, and Pete's got this gator, you know, that... that mm-hmm. yeah. He's got them shoveling stuff, horse stuff, <laughs> off the back. I'm looking at them. They are covered yeah. with it. Yeah. And I said, what are you doing, guys? You know, we're supposed to be, you know, in San Francisco, and, you know... To, 
Pete looks at me and goes, I had to know they were Andy's boys. <laughs> <laughs> you, they loved him. They, they just loved him. That's right. Um, speaking of Andy's boys and, and doing that kind of work, I mean, the boys would tell stories, too, that, that Andy, when he would drive around the city, um, would always have uh, gardening shears in the trunk of the car. And if he drove past a, a sign, like a traffic sign, like a you know a yield sign or or some, that sort of thing, and it was occluded by bushes or overgrown, you know, he'd stop, he'd pull over and stop the car. And, Get out and, of the you car, know, boys! It, it, you know was, what to do. I mean, this was your, you know, this was, <laughs> this was your, your your you know your congressman at work, right? But oh, that is a funny story. There, you should yeah. tell that story. And uh, uh, so the boys grew up with this ethic uh one of the lessons i learned from andy andy was not inclined to walk past a piece of litter on the sidewalk or on the floor uh and the, what he would say about it was well you know i didn't put it there but i would have left it there you know you didn't put it there but you left it there mm-hmm. um i mean same yeah. mentality that would you know well, I, I it wasn't my tree that overgrew the stop sign but you know the stop sign needs to be visible so you get out and and you know you had them out there filling potholes after dinner you know we just go out there and people be like get out of the street you know and and you know just keep working boys just keep working so they so he raised them and he was raised to have this sense of what this is public service Mm -hmm. and this is what you need to be doing in your community and i don't know i think somewhere we've lost that but my yeah my favorite story is the morikawas who are like the auntie carrot and uncle Derek. but they had they they were they live in california now but they had a tree down and their neighbor was complaining about it and so my she calls and she says kim she says we don't know what to do how do we get this tree out of our backyard and i said that's okay and he was coming home from washington at um and so he came home and he picked up one of the three chainsaws he owned and he took one of the boys and he went and buzzed up the tree and this rather irate neighbor came back and she goes, I thought I saw Andy Jacobs in your backyard. <laughs> and she said, it's your congressman at work. <laughs> he just, he did. He very just, generous he and public spirited guy. We never, ever, we could be going somewhere and be in a time crunch and he would not pass a car on the road. And I'll bet you experienced that when you were working with him. And because he was, he, he treated... What I saw him with 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 his staff was the same way he kind of ran things at home with the kids. Is that yeah we just we're going to do this because this is what we do and you know we're not going to walk past litter. We're, yeah, you, know. you talk about being in cars. Um, Andy, Andy, I mean this is in nineteen sixty eight, sixty nine, and uh, he, he would not start the car. Until you put on your seatbelt. This is before seatbelts, uh-huh. seatbelt laws. This is before they were putting seatbelts mm-hmm. in cars. Mm-hmm. But he had he had lap belts, you know, and he would not start the car. That's how I got in the habit of putting on my seat, wearing my seatbelt, was because Andy would not start the car until you put your seatbelt on. He was such a big he he was such a fanatic about this that uh, the Batman was very popular. You know, very sure. er, very early on, and very early on in the Batman series, Andy writes a letter to whatever network that is, mm-hmm. and says, "You've got to have Batman tell Robin when they get in the bat car, put on your seatbelt." And goddamn, they did. <laughs> they did. I mean, it, it, Adam West on it, 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 safety it, it, first, Robin. It, yeah, it, <laughs> It was like three or four months later, but there is Batman said, hey, "Yeah, probably. safety yeah. first. There safety first. Put on that seatbelt." Yeah. Yeah. Let me mention three. Three. Uh, that's now. That's a story that I had not heard. Three influences on his life, and you guys can take it as you will. Andy Jacobs, Senior, mm-hmm. United States Marine Corps, and the Korean Peninsula, and Mrs. Andrew Jacobs Sr. Absolutely. She was the smartest woman of, as I've ever known and uh, best woman I've ever known. 
And something of a stickler for grammar, if I recall correctly. Oh, yes, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he developed a lot of vocabulary and manner of speaking by it, these are, these, being corrected by his mom on a few occasions. These were people, like, like mom was from Kentucky. She had 11 brothers and sisters, but she was... She was brilliant, yeah. absolutely. Car- charter signers of the Indiana Civil Liberties Union during the McCarthy time. Mm. They were brave people who thirsted for justice. Yeah. Just, Did he talk about his experiences in the war much? Well, only only when he recounted that you know that they were they were overrun. But uh, no, he didn't. He he talked a lot about about the Marine Corps, and uh, Marines are. Uh, pretty obnoxious when it comes to the marine corps now 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 you 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 know i i will, <laughs> think you're going to get an argument from I, I, about. I, 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 you know i don't I, I, will, I, will, I will tell you court. that if, my mother called legitimately my mother called me a pussy when i joined the army. <laughs> that's go. a true story legitimately told me that well if if you if you hear somebody talk about when i was in the service they were in the air force or the army you know, maybe the Navy, but you would never, you Marines, they say when I was in the Marine Corps, mm-hmm. they would never say when I was in the service. They're like Notre Dame grads. It, well, <laughs> you know, the, 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 the definition of the most. From the golden age. <laughs> yeah, the definition of the most obnoxious guy that you'd ever run into is a, 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 a Marine Notre Dame graduate from Texas who had recently had an operation. <laughs> <You know. laughs> he, he, you know, you see I why he got a- he got along great with Andy. You oh, know yeah. this that Andy loved Louis Mayer. Oh yeah, because he Louis's humor is. He's, well, when he's I not letting that out of the bag yet. Here, <laughs> Andy gave a speech. In oh, it's probably been 10, 12 years ago now, to the uh, Indianapolis Civil War Roundtable. And I went, a huge crowd for him. I think he was on the Bicentennial Commission, the Lincoln Bicentennial Commission yeah, at the was. time. And huge crowd. And he and I had a conversation afterward. He goes, you know, you should you should give a speech to the, to the round table. And I was like, I'd have to think about what to write about. And he goes, well, let's figure it out. And so I did. I ended up giving a speech on the relationship between Lincoln and Grant. Mm-hmm. And the congressman came to it. Uh, it was at the Historical Society. My good friend P.E. McAllister flew up from Florida for it. Nice. Nice. And I enjoyed it. And then I had given the speech to other civil roundtables around the, the Midwest. Uh, but when my mother was there for it, I said, I've been waiting for this moment for a long time. Andy Jacobs, USMC, please meet. Anna Del Dorn, USMC. <laughs> and they both paused and they said Semper Fi to each other at the exact same <laughs> time. Nice. His father was politically active, as I he recall. He was a congressman. That's right. Mm-hmm. And so court judge. how much, and a judge, that's right. Mm-hmm. How much did that push in a nice way, in a benevolent way, Andy towards running for office, that level of public. A lot of us get involved in politics, but it takes a special breed and brand to want to go through actually putting your name on the ballot. I will tell you that uh, Andy told me one time, it was, it was almost in passing, that, that he had decided he wanted to be in Congress from the time he was about 16. And when I thought back on that later, that was about the time his father entered Congress. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think that um, is what is what caused him initially, at least. I mean, when he's a teenager, to think about uh, going into Congress is to you know to be uh, where his father was. Um, what do you think, if you had to say, would be? Andy was there in tumultuous times, elected in '64, so he's there for the Civil Rights Movement. And the war. He's he there helped, for the Vietnam he, he War. He helped write the 65 Voting Rights Act. And he and Jim Corman, and I'm trying to think who else was on that committee, but they allegedly wrote, he, he, penned, it, he penned it on the back of a legal pad. I'm going through his papers hoping to find that, you know, a copy of whatever it is that they initially penned. <laughs> but there were, a lot of, there were a lot of hands in that. that you know, we, we have to make sure we credit. There are a lot of, a lot of people, people's two cents in that. But. You have the but, Vietnam War. 
You have Watergate. Really? You you are best. Can I can I ask? I hear a lot of. I hear today. You know, well, I'm gonna, if I get over there, I'm going to stand up to. You know, I'm going to. I'm going to stand up to the powers that be. And you were there when he was standing up about Vietnam. And I know that he was wildly unpopular for six years because he advocated against the Vietnam War and people, other members in, of Congress, I mean, they don't talk to you in elevators. I mean, I don't mm-hmm. think people can really comprehend that, that when you stand up for whatever it is you believe in, you are ostracized. He wasn't exactly LBJ's favorite congressman. No, no. Um it's but, hard, isn't it? But yeah, but but I will tell you that he was he was insulated somewhat politically. He was insulated by being a marine, and uh, you couldn't you know you couldn't uh, say that uh, he had not experienced it. You couldn't say right. that you know that he had not been in the service and all that. And let's not forget that Andy was may have been the person I don't know for sure, but may have been the person who who coined the term chicken hawk. War wimps. And a war wimp. These were the people uh, who advocated uh, for the war, for the continuation of the war, for us to continue to send tens of thousands of more young men, primarily, uh, into the maw of this war uh, that ended up costing 55,000 American lives uh, to no end. Um, You know, I... One of the first conversations I had with Andy after I got out, and I had been out maybe six months or something like that. Out of the Marine Corps. Out of the Marines. And, and I told him, I said, Andy, I said, you know, I said, I'm, I, I says, I've gone from being for the war to being kind of iffy about this thing, you know. And uh, he says, I've gone from being iffy about this thing to being against, you know. And... Uh, which kind of surprised me and I think helped me, you know, get over there as well. Well, to Kim's point, I mean, looking back at Vietnam now and the war, you think that it was always a disaster. It was always unpopular. No, People no, no, were no, always no. rioting. But 64, 65, 66 was a different era he in the conflict. The, right. He traveled around the country with Al uh, Lowenstein. Lowenstein, yeah. yeah. And, yeah. And, and, and I think slept oh, in their cars. Al- because, Lowenstein. Well, he was he was a member yeah, of Congress, but he was a New peace York. advocate. Believed didn't believe we belonged in Vietnam. Uh, but here, here is they're sleeping in their car because they would be checking into a hotel. They'd be traveling around the country giving speeches against the war, and they wouldn't get a room in a hotel because people would recognize them. Mm-hmm. And so they slept in their cars. And Andy, the type of person about, to say, "I told you so." I, I no, 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 no. About I don't, that. I don't think he no, was. No, uh, not retrospectively. I don't think either, but not, I'm not retrospectively. What he was, uh, you asked about the influences of, of his, his dad, the Marine Corps, and, and uh, Korea. And the Marine Corps and Korea ended up being the same influence in a way. The two mm-hmm. combined because his experience in Korea turned, I think, helped him become an anti war Marine. Uh, and that, uh, you know, is, is for a lot of people was a bit of a, a oxymoron perhaps at times, but he wasn't, he was a fervently anti-war Marine. Well, don't forget. And, and I think it was partly the experience of his, you know, I mean, I think people who have been there, you know, understand in a different way and at a different level, nope. uh, in a non-abstract way, what it is to, uh, to, to send people into combat. Don't forget his dad was had been in Congress, so here he mm-hmm. you know he, he comes from a family of means. He's educated, and he was not the typical kind of young man who they were sending over as cannon fodder. Mm-hmm. In fact, he was in California. And he tells the story of a prominent person here in Indianapolis calling, saying, "Andy, we can get you out of this." And he said, "No, I will go, sir." So, so what he has in this experience is seeing. The, you know, the, the powers that be, the people in Congress who've never seen a shot fired in anger, the rich uh, uh, people of this country sending these young men to Korea. And these, are, these young men he is serving with are, they're poor, hmm. they're immigrants. Does this sound familiar today? Mm-hmm. And he didn't think it was fair. Right. And it's a lot of folks who rejoined the military after World War II because they didn't have anything else to do. Exactly. Hmm. He had that rare 
view. And the other thing about Korea that I, how many of us can even imagine the mortars coming around our heads? He couldn't go to Fourth of July because he couldn't. Yeah. Yeah. Couldn't keep it together. How many of us can even imagine lying face down in the dirt while the Chinese are running over your soul and you're praying to God they don't see that you're still living? And that made him fearless. I remember we were sitting in the car with Pete Visklosky and they were mad at him for some reason. They're going to take his committee chairmanship. And he goes, fine, do it. I don't care. Mm -hmm. He was fearless because he knew what bad really could be. Mm -hmm. And in and, and his time... As an anti-Vietnam War, I'm going to say agitator, but that's maybe not the best word, sure does. served him well when it became clear that young men were dying for no real purpose. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I asked earlier, he never, he never in my conversations, which obviously are, are just a fraction of, of what you three have had, he never looked at me and said, you know what, Robert, I was right. He never said that, ever. You, you know, here's something else that, Louis, I don't know if you remember this, uh, but they, when they shipped him over, they shipped them over on a privatized ship, and they didn't feed the boys except they'd bring out the big tubs of mashed potatoes and they'd throw them a piece of bread because they didn't expect they would live. They didn't value them. So he, imagine how long it took them to get from Korea, from California. Mm-hmm. And that was a he, and he come back and he was said he would pray. He said, "God, I'll I'll do you right. I'll say the rosary twice a day." And he did. He never <laughs> broke that promise. And uh, and he said, "I will fight against privatization because it's bad." This is, I mean, he he really he felt like he owed God something. I'll make it right. I'll work to make it right. Before he, before we get done, I, there's there's a Andy Jacob story I need to tell. The, the car. The, it doesn't it doesn't have anything to do with. Vietnam or anything like that, but uh, Andy Jacobs was famous for his uh, uh, his tight fistedness when it came to the federal budget and and wasting money and that sort of thing. He would return money from his own budget. And he well, he he re, he returned his uh, uh, a portion of his pay. Yeah, you know, I was on the staff when he first did that, and I remember saying to him, "Are you nuts? <laughs> <laughs> you know what the hell are you doing?" Yeah, but but he came by this parsimony, honestly, because he practiced it himself. Uh, he he uh, called me into the office one day, and he said, uh, and he's got on, he's getting ready to leave, and he so he's got his suit jacket on. It's in the summertime. It's a kind of a tan poplin suit that uh, didn't quite make it to the tops of his shoes, and. Uh, he said, uh, he says, Lou, he kind of goes like this, you know, pulls on the jacket. He says, what do you think? And I said, about what, Andy? He says, the suit. <laughs> he says, what do you think? It's really, and I told him, I said, it's quite natty. I said, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a very nice suit. And he says, $32. <laughs> <laughs> he said, I paid $32 for this suit. Hey, Amen. And I told him, I said, Andy. That is at least a forty dollar suit, <laughs> <laughs> and and he, you've gotten a steal, you know. Made the day. <laughs> so, but I mean, he he had he had a pair of black shoes. I'm not making this up. He had a pair of black shoes. Actually, he had two pairs of black shoes that were identical, and he wore one one day and one the next day because he was convinced that they would both last longer if he alternated them back and forth. <laughs> you, know? you know, at his retirement party, we had a fashion show. We had it there at the Ways and Means, oh, and God. all the kids wore oh, his God. clothes and did a big fashion <laughs> show with all the greatest hits. He, he, was, he well, was a piece of work when it came to kids, spending money. <laughs> the kids tell about, you know, when Stephen tells the story uh, at 
uh, Westlane. He was at Westlane, and everybody else has to sign in and check in, but not his father about just being so embarrassed. You know, Andy would just go into whatever school they were in and just go right by. What room are they in? And they go, oh, this one, sir. And, yeah. and he tells about his dad throwing open the door in history class one time. Bronco! <laughs> and he forgot your lunch. <laughs> but, but he We've was... got, a, we got a few more minutes uh, left, uh, but I'd be remiss if I didn't ask about the relationship that, that Andy had with the Carson family, both Julia and Andre. Mm. Um, uh, how Julia, proud was he of Julia's service and 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 the family's legacy here in basically the urban core in Marion County? Oh, I think he was extremely proud. I mean, he made no bones about uh, who he was for when it came when he retired. Right, that uh, he was for Julia. Uh, but you have to know that Julia, when Julia worked in the office, she was 19 years old, fresh out of the foundry. And, and when Andy won, he said, I want an African-American working in my office. And so he went to uh, Lloyd Wright's dad and said, who, who's big UAW, and said, who do you have? Well, you know, and Jim Beatty tells the story about going to interview her. And she, could, she was so shy that she could barely lift her head up to talk with them. Um, but, uh, she, so she, she would take care of my mother and father-in-law and she'd go there from the office. If he wasn't there, she'd check in on them. She was family. My, she, she never knew her own father. And my father-in-law said to her one time, I will be your father. And so he always referred to her as my little sister. Mm -hmm. And, uh, when I married Andy, Andre was maybe 12, 13 years old and would come to the house and. And when he died, he said, "You just we have two sons, but you look after you look after him like he's he is ours." And I don't know. You probably have closer, more political things to tell, but he felt this kinship with them, and and we all signed on. Mm -hmm. Last thought, Professor Bloomquist. Um, a, a genuinely kind person uh, who was as generous with his uh, time. Uh, as he could possibly be, and uh, I, I, I valued not only who he was as a public servant, but uh, because I came in, he, he came into my life after that, uh, I valued who he was as, as a friend, and I still do. You are listening to Leaders and Legends, a podcast presented by Veteran Strategies, a local veteran public relations enterprise, and sponsored by Girl Scouts of Central Indiana, the Crown Plaza Hotel and Grand Hall and Conference Center at Historic Union Station, and McAllister Machinery, your friendly neighborhood Caterpillar dealer. I will close with two quick stories. One is I asked him, him being Andy Jacobs, to sign my copy of the Keith Bulin biography. Mm. He signed it, Andy Jacobs, victim. <laughs> <laughs> Second, oh, great. Uh, to go back to something that Kim said kind of at the beginning when we were talking about Richard Luger and the Indy Star was very kind to let me write a column about Senator Luger after his passing. And this story is in this in that column. I went to go see Andy. He was bedridden and we hung out for about an hour talking about Civil War history and politics and various other things. And he says, well, where are you headed after here? You're not going to hang out here all day, are you? Don't you have something better to do? <laughs> and I said, actually, I'm going to a fundraiser for Senator Richard Luger. This would have been um, probably April 2012. And he goes, really? He says, go over to that drawer. And there was a drawer by his bed where he had kept money. And he says, hand it to me. And I did. And he peeled off a $20 bill. And he says, you give this to my friend, Dick Luger. You tell him it's for me. I said, okay. So I go to this fundraiser and it's at someone's house. And at the end of it, before it starts, I said, look, at the very end of Senator's remarks, may I make a very brief presentation? And I, I promise it's, it's quick, but it'll have some impact and, and people will enjoy it. And the host said, yes. Yes. So Richard Luger finished and the host said, Robert Vane would like to make a very quick presentation. And I said, Senator, I just came from the bedside of someone who wants to contribute 
which is for him a substantial amount of money. <laughs> and since you, if you knew anything about Senator Luger or went to his memorial service, uh, he wasn't exactly a free spender either. And Senator Luger looked at me, goes, Robert, go ahead. And I pulled out a $20 bill and I said, please consider this a personal contribution from Andy Jacobs. And it is not an exaggeration to say that tears welled in the eyes of Richard Luger at the kindness of his friend, Andy Jacobs. Louis Mayhern, Bill Bloomquist, Kim Hood Jacobs, thank you very much. It was an absolute blast. We love Andy Jacobs. We honor him. And this city and all of us who love it are better off because of his kindness, his stories, his generosity of intellect and spirit. And we remember him fondly today and always. Thank you very much for listening to Leaders and Legends, brought to you by Veteran Strategies Incorporated. If you want to contact us about this program or our menu of public relations services, please send us an email at robert at veteranstrategies.com. That's robert at veteranstrategies.com.